But anyway, I've had some experiences. Uh, like I told Paul and Becky, I said I could go on for hours. Well, we should. That's, uh, how about if we, uh, we tell Lyle how we introduced No. Well, yeah, you I'd like to tell him. Yeah, tell him. Yeah, well, this is pretty cool, because, you know, I, myself, I've been researching the, the Bigfoot Sasquatch such, subject since 1988. So I'm going on, like, 25 years. And, in 2004, um, there was an expedition by the BFRL that was being held in the Claylock area, the Olympic Peninsula. And yeah. so my wife actually talked to Matt on the phone, and I'd been doing this, you know, for a long time already. Being in Wenatchee, kind of isolated from a lot of the other people, and so I was one. I didn't even realize there were so many people that were interested in our view, you know. So I wanted to meet some of these people. And, I went on the expedition, I went over and I met Matt, and there was about 20, 25 of us, and that's when I met Clifton Harris and Kevin Jones, you know, currently. So I met all these people, and, and uh, we were driving out to one of the uh, Indian uh, fish hatcheries, fish where, where there was supposedly been some sightings of the Sasquatch coming to feed. And so I'm in the, one of the rigs, and we're going down through the forest, and it's, you know, the rainforest, it's all dark, and all of a sudden, Matt comes over the radio, it's like, oh, yeah, wait, Bob, Bob's here, I got Bob Gibbons right me, my and I'm like, whoa, Bob Gibbons, you know, all of a sudden, I'm just like, it's so, his car, it just happened to be, we were on the same road, and he pulled up right behind me, and he gets out, and I got out at the same time, and was like, well, hi, I'm Paul Gray, this is me, I'm Bob Gibbons. We ended up walking down to the where, to the river, and along the way there was these huge bear tracks coming down, just fresh as could be. I mean, just like it walked there. So it was that was my introduction, just kind of walking a trail in the woods, looking at tracks with Bob. And it was, yeah, it was really cool. And since that day, you know, we with him living in Yakima and me living in in Wenatchee and being really close, we ended up. Becoming really good friends. We've been close friends yeah. ever since. We spent a lot of time together, and in fact, his Roger Patterson, who he you know got the film, mm -hmm. the famous film. Roger had a cousin that lived almost right next door to me. When he actually, you know, remember Mrs. Barnett, the old lady that lived up on Cherry Street? Mm -hmm. Sure. She was like this old hermit lady. She was she she raised cherries, but her she was related. First or second, first sister or something to Roger Patterson. Oh, wow. direct descendant. Small, so, small world. Yeah, and she. I mean, I literally lived in the orchard right, you know, next to her. Of course, I didn't know all that. The sixth. I mean, I heard about Bigfoot in the sixties and seventies. You know, going to Camp Field up at Leavenworth, but me being wanting to be a musician, you know, I had other things at the time that I was interested in. Too. So then it was around 1988 when I was sit at my sister's house and a TV show come up about Bigfoot. This guy that was sitting there, had a couple sitting there, and he, just, he just looked up at me and he goes, you know, I've seen one of those things. And I was kind of, and I'm like, and he goes, yeah, the Indiana Valley. He told me where it was, and he was hunting, and the thing was crouched down, and he had it in his rifle, and he couldn't pull the trigger because of the, the it was like grimacing. It was grimacing human, but it was making these expressions too. It wasn't just like a dull animal look. And he just literally, you know, he was like, no way, you know. And that story just totally opened up everything for me. And of course, meeting Bob and all the great folks. Well, and I, and excuse me, Paul. No, no, okay, no, But I've been lucky enough to be out on a, some of the field yeah, researchers yeah. with Paul. And Paul always, and Paul and I agree, we both agree on kind of the same way that some of this field research and should be done. The only thing is, Paul documents all that stuff and does go with it, and I just kind of remember it, because I don't do much book work and, and I don't do any photography. So consequently, uh, uh, in my personal opinion, uh, uh, Paul is probably the best field researcher that I know in the business. That I actually does research. Ted and Ke uh, Colonel Jones and I, we were up at the bumping area, a place that we all know is, is named the Frog Pond. And uh, we had a campfire going, it was about 9 30, 10 at night. And the road goes right within 15 feet or so, about 20 feet, I guess, from where the campfire is. And the road is uh, wide enough for two vehicles to go one each way. And uh, so we were all sitting there that night with the campfire going and uh, just kind of sitting there visiting and, and all at once across over 
into the tree line, which was just on the other side of the road, at the edge of the road, we heard something walking through there and didn't think a whole lot of it until it got just even with us. When it got even with us, it let out a roar that just, it'll just raise you right up out of the chairs. Well, immediately, uh, Ted had a big German Shepherd dog with him, he takes, takes him with him everywhere. And uh, he was sitting closest to the road. So he and the dog, uh, Ted jumped up and the dog followed him and he ran for his rig. He said, I'm, I'm like getting the hell out of here. <laughs> and uh, Kevin Jones jumped up and ran to his tent to get his recorder. And, uh, and I bails out and runs out into the road and let out the best little holler that I could give them, the Bigfoot holler. And it just went, uh, well, it covered the ground a little further from here to the front end of this building. And just that length of time, it covered that uh, and let out another yell. Just another one of them, the ones that just lift you up. And so, I was going to leave. I was going to leave because I had to be at a yard sale at the backcountry horses putting on the next morning at 5 o'clock. Well, I said, Chase, the thing might come back through here. So I just I just went in my tent and stayed all night kind of with, I don't hear well, but with one ear kind of to the ground thinking, it maybe will come back. Thinking it, it maybe just thought, hey, I'll scare them some of the guns good and I might come back. Well, we never had any more activity that night. But Kevin didn't get his recorder turned on in time to get that second yell. So that's how quick these things can descend if they want to. And of course, we never did hear it run. Yeah, it's, it's uh, a, what, 130 yards probably? Give or take about oh, 100 yeah. yards from the Queen's building. Yeah, and it covered it within a few seconds. Yes, well, yeah, the amount of time, I'd say probably 15 seconds it took us to get all what we did there, all that. I jumped up out of, out of the chair, run, got, let Ted was going this way, and I ran around Ted and run out into the road, and Kevin run to get his recorder and back out. And uh, all of this is just like that, that, happening that fast, and that thing covered that much ground in that time. And that disc, so whether it actually run or whether it made it the strike. Of course, you know, uh, when Roger and I uh, saw this creature down there, when it got out of our sight, up another creek bed, uh, we, did, we couldn't accurately measure everything because there was no uh, tracks in the gravel. But the gravel was turned over and there were still damp ones up. And we measured in between the steps, and it, we measured a 68 to 72 inch stride. Wow. And in before that. That's right after you see Patty walking along the creek. No. You know, that's the film, the famous film, and he was there on horseback. Right when she goes out is when he tracked her. And she sped up at that time, and when she was walking through the area, it was only about 40 something? 46 to 48. 48, but when she started running later, it was up to 60, almost 70 inches, so she really picked up her speed. And so, uh, there was a lot of uh, spec speculation about that, wondering why the apparently ran, she apparently ran. So uh, there was a lot of speculation about that, why she moved so fluently and, and, and well, we were present and then after it got out of our sight, covered ground that fast. So, you know, we don't know what to say, why they do these things. And then, I think there was a other one there. I think so too. Apparently, uh, Lyle, uh, she went up on a little ridge around and was, was actually looking down. Well, they, this is what they assumed. That's what they found where she sat down. Sat down and yeah. was there and probably could look right down where Roger and I was doing the, the filming of the tracks and the casting. And the casting and stuff. So that's what the speculation was on that part of it. A uh, guy that was really good into this is Bob Titmuss at that time. He's deceased now, but yes, he was in the Bigfoot big time and had seen him before up in the Alaskan area and uh, uh, different places, you know. And so he 
he went up there and did a lot of study and uh, field research on that and followed up where she last, where we last saw the tracks going up through the side of the mountain uh, and through the rocks and the cliffs. And so that was kind of the deal on that one. Well, his, the valley that that happened, you know, just for a little history, it's interesting because tracks were being found up there uh, since the 50s. Yeah. And, you know, year after year or a couple of years ago, but there was a lot of track finds, even before Roger was contacted or anything. And then Roger finally got a hold of him and said, hey, we got to go back down here because they just found fresh tracks. And that's why they ended up going back down. Yeah, that's why we're But the Karuk Indians who live along the river there, is it the Trinity River or the. Uh, but it's, it's, it's the other big one. Yeah. But uh, the Klamath. The Klamath. And uh, but the Karuk Indians who actually lived at the base of Bluff Creek, they there's it's a written I have the book at home and it's a written history of they would not go up the Bluff Creek Valley because of the large hair covered people that lived there. Right. And so, you know, here's documentation. It was clear back into the Indian times of this area where Bob, where they got the film. And yet, that's California. That's the Northern the, California. The Wenatchee Valley, the, the 300 year old, uh, the night view. Yeah, yes. So they, uh, that's just your toe not toe. Yeah, toe not toe. Yeah. They, they had that archive back 300 years. Yes, exactly. And I use that in my, when I talk about that history. Of, you know, the, the, in Wenatchee, and then the new people that came in, the first, they called him the old man of Mission Ridge, hmm. in reference to the assassin. Is that going to be in the... Yeah, oh, I'll cool. mention it. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Roger mentioned me a couple of times before we went down there. I'd never been there before. Roger had been down there, and he talked to uh, different ones down there, uh, Jerry Crew and, uh, and Al Hodgson and uh, Bob Titmus and quite a few different ones, but he had talked to some old miner back in there that had lived in there before anybody started logging back in the hills, and he lived back there just about, uh, not quite as, we were back about 33, 33 to 35 miles back in, and this old miner, when I say back in, that's from the little place called Willowton, and this old miner apparently was about 25 miles back in there where he could pack in and pack out. And he said when he first, he, Roger tells me that this miner told him, when he first started going back in there as a young man, he'd see these great big giant tracks in the mud down by the creeks, when he'd cross the creek. And he said, I just thought it maybe was great, huge, big Indians that had some of them big feet, because they were pretty good size. And so he said, never thought too much of it. Now this is Roger telling me what the guy told him. Yeah, but he didn't, Roger ever did tell me that the guy actually saw a big one. Whether he did tell Roger that, I don't know. But, you know, sometimes Roger would rattle along to me and I didn't pay that much attention to him. You know, I'd be busy thinking about where I was driving and, uh, and one time, Roger was kind of a different guy. We were going over the Mount St. Helens area and I was driving an old Dodge truck, an old kind of a half Dodge truck with a flatbed on it. We had horses and everything in the back. And I was driving, I had the moccasins on. And uh, I come up to this curve and I was going too fast and had to make a curve to go across that river. That was before they changed on that. And to cross the Collins River, across the bridge there. And I was going too fast so I couldn't make that turn. So I started hitting that uh, brake pedal with that big old steel jack that got rattled up underneath the, my foot there and I was hammering on that brake. And I knew I couldn't get slowed down enough to make the bridge, so I just went right on up a little dirt trail over a little log here. And uh, I finally got stopped, and the left front door was hanging over the bank. And I, I headed it right towards a tree, like a tree about the size of that, that had grown up from way down below. And I knew if I could hit that tree, at least I probably would roll down in. It was like 300 feet down to the Calus River. And so, uh, when I got the truck stopped, I just sat there. Roger just bailed out on that side and puked all over the road. And, uh, scared him so bad, he couldn't even hardly walk. He couldn't stand up. And 
my foot was hurt from hammering onto that steel jack and I got out and evaluated and the horses and jammed the horses and all the gear we had right up in, in a big mess in front. And Roger said, you know how close we come to dying? I said, I know how close we come to dying. <laughs> Rolled all the way off that road. We'd have rolled right down into the river. But anyway, you know, I mean, still it's you gotta do what you do to do to survive. Yep. And I've had I've had the great father with me all along, or I've been gone a long time ago, you know. And I'm just blessed. I'm a blessed man. Really lucky. But then I've been told by this Mr. Tan that writes his books that we were looking for in there. Oh, yeah. He said that, uh, well, Bob, you know that uh, if you hadn't have been with Roger, Roger Hill would have seen a big fight. But he said, you, you got, you've got something with these big foot that, that, that are protecting you or whatever. But, you know, I really don't feel I have as much as Paul here as God with him because he's had some really close stuff and he's probably shared that with you too, Lyle. Yeah. Uh, and so consequently, uh, between him and uh, uh, Colonel Jones, uh, Kevin Jones, uh, they've had some pretty good, uh, powerful stuff happen to him. And, uh, I'm trying to understand the whole thing, Stan. You know, it's like I tell a lot of my friends, I don't, I don't care about the truth. Because we all know they exist. We do. Half the world already knows these things exist. And my, I don't care about proving it to the other half of the world because maybe that other half of the world shouldn't know anyway. That's what I want to do is try it. While I'm still on this earth, I would like to try to at least make people realize that everything that they see, you know, you just can't come up and pull a gun out or shoot it or, or the way you treat it. You know what I mean? It's like. I think, you know, this whole Sasquatch thing could be quite simpler than we all realize. I think that's why I have the luck, because the way I introduce myself is I'm not aggressive, I use music, and there's so many people that, you know, I, I hear a lot of my hunter friends like, well, I'd take a pot shot at it if I saw it. It's like, well, why? If it was just walking by, why would you shoot something that was not harming you? And see, the great apes in Africa were all related to the gorillas and the monobos and the not Maybe not the monobos, but Great, the big, the orangutans, the gorillas. Over there, it's work, you know, and it should be no different in America. People should realize that no, it's very wrong to show these things. Well, Lyle, what I preach, or I say don't preach, but what I advocate is if we avoid violence and fear, and usually the fear causes violence, we'll get a lot further with these. With these uh, Bigfoot and uh, or ourselves. I know. <laughs> that's exactly you know. Maybe that's the perfect test. You know, it's like if we can if we can treat. Yeah. Go ahead, Bob. Well, no, and, and Paul and Paul's doing what I would like to see done with a lot more people. And you know, uh, uh, I'm getting old, and, and I'd like to be able to see one again, to where I can act. Even if I could get up close enough to it to just act some message or, or uh, whatever to it, to just get up and uh, try to uh, try to get some some communication of some type with one of them and uh, try to try to do that sort. Of, if we could kind of do that, like the Native Americans say, well, they lived among us as brothers, only we respected them because they were big, strong. And, uh, even some tribes had a, uh, and I, maybe I shouldn't say this because uh, when I start talking about the uh, Native Americans thought and think, that's things that I, that's been taught and told to me down the line and not from the mouth of the people that believe that. So probably my best bet is to not even uh, repeat what uh, I had heard of. Uh, People, white people say that the Indians had talked to them years before, that they talked about them uh, thinking that these were some of the great warriors that were great in battle and stuff. And they came back, they came back as great, huge, big, hairy men. But I don't know that to be a fact, you see. That's, that's stuff that we've that, heard that before. Anyway, uh, but anyway, that's kind of where it's at on this thing. And I might. So, you know, uh, 
until we learn a lot more and try to quit uh, shooting at them and run them and screaming and hollering from, from them and uh, yeah. try to be more friendly and try to understand. I, I strongly believe that uh, Ron Moorhead had the right idea, except I don't believe these things really like to be. Uh, I don't, this is just my personal belief that they don't like to be filmed or uh, even recorded. And so they'd like to live by themselves the way they want to live and us be friendly to them. But Moorhead and them left them stuff called the heat and, and actually gave them stuff. So if we can do more of that and understand what they would like and help them, and, Get away from this violent thing and start shooting at them and scared of them and so forth. You know, I know something that big. If that skeleton right there had muscle and bone on it, I mean muscle on it all over that skeleton, and, and it walked down the middle of the moonlight night, uh, I can't say whether I'd run or I to be scared. But the way I feel right now, no, I would not. I would try my best, no bigger than I am. Even if it picked me up and threw me 50 feet, I'd say I had it coming. You know? But that's kind of where my belief is. And if I ever have that opportunity to get close to one again, uh, see, at that particular time, uh, Roger and I both had rifles on our scabbards, on our saddles, and I don't even really know why the reason was, because I always rode out with a rifle on my scabbard. And so when I stepped down off that horse, I did pull that rifle out. And when I was standing there, I was standing there like well, that. Roger yelled to cover you. Yeah, he did. But I did never raise that rifle up. I didn't have a scope on it anyway. But I never raised that rifle to my shoulder, ever. And, uh, and I'm glad now, at that particular time, I don't even, well, the only reason I didn't is because I had no fear of it coming back as long as it was walking away. Right. And so, therefore, I never raised the rifle up, and I'm really, I'm really glad now that I never did. Yeah, see, I could have, I could have got back up on the horse, I suppose. Uh, but that, uh, that would have took a little bit of time, and, and I feel that at that particular time, the way the way it was covering the ground, going away from us, that if it wanted to hurry back, it could come back so fast that you wouldn't have a lot of time to react or something. And we know now that they're extremely fast when they want to be, uh, faster than than we could even imagine. But that's kind of right. Until we learn more and we get more people like you and Paul and Mike here and, and the people that are here to try and protect these things from, like Skamania County had the ordinance to protect them. And uh, I think it still does to an extent, maybe not to the magnitude it were before, but I think they still got that ordinance. And uh, I was just reading a thing uh, and, and one of the maps that Skamania County has more sightings and more activity than any place in North America. I didn't know that either until I read that. Now, whether that's just somebody saying or whether it's actually happening, I don't know. I, I really don't know that. But I do know that there's been lots of sightings over there in Skamania County and uh, a lot of activity over the years. And so, uh, but the forest over there is, is pretty dense also. The Olympic Peninsula probably, if you could get around over there a little bit better, in my opinion, would probably just, there'd be just as many sightings and just as much evidence. But over there, you know, it rains so much that, uh, that there's not, uh, you just cannot gather that kind of evidence. Right, the environment is so different.